from Mississippi. I'm from the deep South, right? And I am um, grew up in a beautiful coastal town of Gulfport, Mississippi. So um, I grew up in what I like to call like a tropical paradise, if you will. I didn't know the history of Mississippi until I grew older, right? As I was growing up. So what do you mean by that? So when I was looking at what we now call the Confederate statues, right? They were just, we call them actually monuments. That's what I mean, memorials. They used to call them Confederate memorials. And so we were looking at them. They had a history, but because I was born um, the generation after the civil rights movement, and I was the first generation to go to integrated schools, right? There was this, I was born in this tropical paradise, in this place that has a very um, mixed and nuanced and complex history, and I was coming of age in this ecosystem where there was a legacy, but then I was a part of the hope, right? I was a part of, I mean, I was the heir apparent to the struggles that had happened in the 1960s. So, and there was this, you know, you have this, you know, beautiful um, piece where you're having people, you know, dote over, because again, we were the hope. We were the, you know, the, the opportunity. And so I grew up, you know, um, knowing a song that was, you know, in the, um, in the spirit, one of the songs that's, you know, in the spirit of how I grew up was um, uh, uh, Fannie Lou Hamer's song, This Little Light of Mine. I say that because it was actually a song that was an anthem, right? And it was, you know, everywhere, but most people associated with Fannie Lou Hamer. And so I grew up with that, you know, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. So I grew up, right, with my grandmother, who was once a, a domestic and a sharecropper. I am the grandchild of sharecroppers. And I grew up with this rich understanding that these were basically geniuses who were denied opportunity. And then my father and my mother, my father was a longshoreman. So he was in a union. My mother was in the union. She worked for the federal government. And so I grew up in this sharecropping, you know, ecosystem, an ecosystem that was shaped by sharecroppers and domestics. So everyone who used to come to my grandmother's front porch, now my grandmother's front porch was my first classroom. That's where I got my curriculum. That's when I learned about politics. That's when I learned about how people are. And so when I would go on and I'm taking this culture with me, as I go into the classroom, the former classroom. And so basically in this ecosystem of Gulfport, Mississippi, this, this first generation of hope after the civil rights movement, I grew up with my back strong. So I didn't come from a people who had to go and get a, um, you know, my, my grandfather was illiterate. He died illiterate, okay? My grandfather never voted in Mississippi, never. OK, um, my grandmother would receive a fourth grade education um, Well, didn't even well, not receive. She would obtain a fourth grade education. But because of when she was born. Right. And my grandfather was born in 23. She was born in 1925. And because of where they were born, um, the place that they had, they didn't go beyond schooling for um, um, black children in beyond fifth grade. Right. They had to go miles and miles. And well, so what happens is that she was. Um, you know, when, when she, in the 1970s, again, remember, I was the first generation of that. So as I was learning how to read, my grandmother was learning how to read. But I didn't know that my grandmother was learning how to read. I just thought that my grandmother was just reading along with me. And so therefore, you know, again, this piece about seeing this beautiful world of workers who knew their worth. So even though they may have been in somebody's kitchen, you know, because again, I grew up with people, you know, I mean, coming by my grandmother's house, you know, people be like, well, Miss So-and-so gave us this. And they'll be like discarded clothes, but they'll say, but girl, look at this. I can do this. And because they had these other skills, like seamstress skills or the like sort, they knew how to take something and really create a piece of art with it. And that's that wonderful world that gave way to my political leaning. So I knew that I came from people with strong backs. I celebrate it in the fullest capacity. I also commemorate the sharecroppers who tried to find, uh, form unions in Elaine, Arkansas, 
and unfortunately were slaughtered. My dissertation topic, I'm a university professor, my dissertation was lynching. And um, those um, dreams that were deferred through that and the family's incomes that were impacted by that. I, um, so I do both. I celebrate and then I commemorate and I do it by, right, on some songs, you know, you sing a song of joy and then some songs, you just do what? You do the moan, right? So that's how I commemorate and celebrate by reading, right? And not reading these popular narratives. Right now, everybody is focusing on how to be an anti-racist. I say what you need to read is the biography of that we have plenty of them in African-American history. Read the biographies of people. Read the organizational methods that Black people use to create their infrastructures in their communities, in their institutions. A book that I read um, just recently is a book called The Black Man's Burden. And it is a story by this guy's name is William um, um, Hosclaws. Claus. And uh, it's a fascinating book about how he started this school um, Utica, in this Utica Institute based off of Booker T. Washington. He was a student of Booker T. Washington. And he talks about, you know, again, how do you deal with the people who had gotten so used to disappointment and they see this opportunity coming and how do they treat that opportunity? So here's a black man shared his narrative about building an institution and right now that institution has now been taken up in another, um, it's called Heinz Community College right outside of Jackson, Mississippi. So the institution went into another institution. So again, getting to know those stories, one of the things that, one of the tricky pieces about Frederick Douglass and Harriet Tubman, I wanna say here, is that in many ways they fit into the American narrative. The American narrative always deals with the exceptions to rules. So in, in the fact that we celebrate Douglas, like I said, you know, you know his story, but remember him and Harriet Tubman are exceptions. How about those four million who did not escape slavery? And so therefore, if you go, sort of go through African-American history and you always looking for the first black people hurt person who did this, for the black first blurt, the first, the first, the first, the first, the first, I say, no, if the first, how about the one, what institutions that we have that we can actually sort of go, you know, go through and come through. So again, but the way that we've always sort of been taught the history is this history of exception. And that goes into the American narrative. But I say go into those 4 million, go into those free blacks whose story does not have a silver line and learn how they basically knew how to negotiate as much as they could, right? And how did they liberate? How did they cultivate their freedom in oppression? And that's how I celebrate and commemorate Black History Month. So, you know, we got this piece now that the way that Black history is taught, we go for these symbolic victories. So right now they're going to give Emmett Till and his mother, Mamie Till, the Congressional Medal of Honor. You understand that that's the highest honor that a civilian can get. Well, both of them are dead. But we have yet to pass the Emmett Till anti-lynching bill. So the symbolism is to give a medal. Oh, they being recognized for their contributions to civil rights. Well, first of all, it wasn't voluntary. <laughs> right? Emmett Till didn't do it voluntarily. His mother didn't, you know. And so what happens is that she did say, show with them what they did to my boy. Right? But for the most part, you know, you have someone. They're now both deceased. You're giving them a symbolism. But why don't we pass that anti-lynching bill? I think the history from 1619 <laughs> is the most important era, right? From 1619 to today, right? Is the most important era, right? <laughs> of our history because it now grapples with, right? Um, how we went from not necessarily been defined as slaves, how we um, end up, you know, going how America created a structure and an infrastructure through laws, through politics, through rhetoric, and then later through media, like minstrel shows and the like sort, and how they created and cultivated caricatures that we in turn at sometimes adopted, and then at sometimes we fought against, and then how we have cultivated our 
freedom through an ever-changing process. Our our identity has, has not been di- um, static in this nation, right? So, you know, you didn't, like right now we use terms like, well, Black Lives Matter. Well, you didn't have to tell Harriet Tubman that. She actually demonstrated it. You didn't have to tell these unknown people who were running away on the Underground Railroad. You didn't have to tell them that. You didn't have to tell United States colored troops who basically when um, when um, when Lincoln and his final Emancipation Proclamation authorized them and they went and they signed up and they fought and they were decisive in you know, ending the Civil War. Right. Um, and so what happens is that you didn't have to tell them that Black Lives Matter. So what we actually see in our history is that our um, identities have never been static. And what we have is iterations. And if we can only, that's why I say it's so important to study the institution building in the infrastructure, because unfortunately what we end up doing is almost like that movie Groundhog Day. You get up, right? And we think we're doing something new. In actuality, right? This really, um, as they say um, in the, um, you know, um, you know, we've already been, our, our struggle have already been paid and, and, and made paid for. So like, for example, um, Anna J. Cooper, a Black woman from the South, she says this in a book called The Voice of the South, when and where I enter, the Black race enters with me. And so therefore, when I go and sit in a room, I'm not feeling like, oh, you know, I'm the first <laughs> or, you know, this like here, you know what I say? I belong at this table. You know how many dreams deferred got me here?